Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we're doing another ship comparison video, this time the G3 class battle cruisers. This was a uh, post-World War I design that the Royal Navy made just prior to the Washington Naval Treaty. Uh, and this design did not get constructed. However, if it had been, they would have been very similar in size and firepower to the Iowa-class battleships, even though they are 20 years older. So, uh, this video is a request from one of our viewers. Uh, if you are interested in seeing certain content from us, let us know in the description below. Let me just warn you that uh, we tend to film our videos a week or more in advance, uh, just so we know we've got content for the next week, and it does take uh, close to a week to edit these videos. Uh, and creating the YouTube content is far from our only job. Um, so there's, there's other stuff going on. If you request a video and you don't see it within a week or two, it's not because we haven't heard you or don't intend to, to make it. Uh, it just means that there's a little bit of lead time before we manage to produce the content. So uh, the G3 class battle cruisers are really more fast battleships. However, the British continue to call any of their fast capital ships battle cruisers, and, and so these are called that. Uh, and particularly because the British had two fairly similar designs running at the same time, a slow, more heavily armed battleship, uh, which would become the N3, and the faster, slightly lighter, well-armed uh, G3, battle cruisers. And the, the silhouettes of these two ships are similar. The rough layout is extremely similar. Uh, the, the only main difference is the size of the guns and therefore the size of the armor, which will uh, be protecting the vitals of the ship. Uh, and this these heavier guns and armor on the N3 battleship variant are uh, larger and thicker than the ones on the G3 version, and so the G3 ends up being faster. So it gets called the battle cruiser, even though it's really a true fast battleship. So, uh, during World War I, the British laid down a couple of uh, classes of battle cruiser in particular. The uh, Renown and Repulse were supposed to be R class battleships, which were laid down pre-war, and um, Jackie Fisher got his hands in there and modified them into battle cruisers. The Courageous, Glorious, and Furious were sometimes called large light cruisers. They, they were more like battle cruisers. They were a wartime construction that Jackie Fisher pulled out that uh, had very little combat value as such. Um, and then the Admiral class battle cruisers were laid down. And uh, these four ships were just started before the Battle of Jutland, which revealed serious flaws in British battle cruiser designs. And so the uh, very excellent hull form of these ships was updated with additional armor plating, particularly on the decks. Three of these ships would be canceled before the end of the war. There just wasn't money. There were other priorities involved. Uh, the, the Royal Navy had essentially boxed up the German high seas fleet and had a superior number of ships, so there wasn't a need for them. However, one of these warships, HMS Hood, was completed in the immediate post-war years. Uh, Hood was an excellent 1918 design uh, and I argue is a fast battleship. Uh, as completed, she has armor that is entirely comparable to other British battleships of the period. Uh, but 
having lost several battle cruisers and then having only one ship from this class built, the British start looking post-war at designs for future ships. Prior to World War I, just about every year, the British would build an updated design, and each design was only a slight improvement over the year before. Uh, so they were constantly building ships, constantly spending money, uh, and the ships were only getting incrementally better. In the post-war years, the British didn't have that much money, uh, and they, they certainly weren't spending it on military affairs like they were prior to World War I. There, there was no uh, evil peer competi competitor like the German high seas fleet, uh, where they had to be in a building race like they were uh, prior to the war. Uh, sort of. The United States and Japan were peer competitors. Both had fought with the British during World War I. Uh, the British had a treaty with the Japanese, and uh, American battleships had actually operated alongside the British home fleet during the war. So they're sort of on friendly terms, but the United States has declared that they want a Navy second to none, and the Japanese have uh, just created a new building program in which they're going to build eight battleships and eight battle cruisers over the course of eight years. Both of these nations had uh, designed ships during World War I, and they had even started um, with their programs while Europe was involved in the war. Um, but then when each of those nations got pulled in, the United States and Japan, their programs slowed down as they built merchant ships, destroyers, that sort of stuff. Uh, but as soon as the war ended, neither of these countries had been ravaged by the war as much as the European powers. Uh, in fact, both had gained from it. Uh, Japan had gotten a number of overseas territories. The United States had lost uh, many uh, of their European competitors for their goods. And so economically it was doing very well. Uh, and so Japan has laid down 16 capital ships. The United States has laid down uh, the four Colorado class battleships, uh, six Lexington class battle cruisers, and six South Dakota class battleships. Uh, all armed with 16-inch guns in the American case. Uh, the Japanese battleships are mostly armed with 16-inch guns. Some are armed with 18-inch uh, guns in secrecy. The British have nothing but 15-inch armed ships. Um, they, they have some armed with 13.5 and some armed with 12-inch guns, but many of those are older and operated so heavily during World War I that they would be decommissioned pretty soon after the war ended. Uh, and so the British decide that they need bigger ships to keep up with the Japanese and Americans. Uh, they also got their hands on some of the German ships, and they were able to look at those ships and see their heavier armor and their... Uh, higher velocity main battery guns. British artillery had tended to be low velocity, heavy projectiles. And the Germans had tended to use very high, pro uh, high velocity, light projectiles. Uh, so the British got a hold of some of these designs and uh, decided to try that out themselves. And so the, the G3 class was authorized uh, around 1921, four ships were authorized. They were authorized without names, but uh, based on British battle cruiser naming conventions, it has been uh, hypothesized that their names would have been Invincible, Indomitable, mm -hmm. Inflexible, and Indefatigable. Uh, the ships were authorized and uh, materials started being collected just prior to the Washington Naval Treaty. Uh, and as a result, they were paused along with the construction of Japanese, American, French, and Italian battleships. And uh, 
as it turns out, they were all canceled because they were too heavy. And so uh, the keels were never laid on any of them, as far as we know. And uh, so they were never completed. Had they been completed, they were designed to displace about 48,000 tons normal. Uh, New Jersey was designed to displace about 45,000 tons standard, probably close to about 48 normal, uh, and about 54,000 tons deep load. New Jersey ended up being just under 58,000 deep load. The British ships would have been 856 feet long, compared to 887 for the Iowas, uh, 106 feet wide, compared to 108 for the Iowas, and uh, 35 feet deep, compared to about 38 for the Iowas. So they are just slightly smaller than an Iowa-class battleship, but negligibly so. Uh, for propulsion, they only produced 160,000 horsepower. Uh, an Iowa-class battleship produces 212,000 horsepower. Uh, the British ships uh, were designed to travel at 32 knots, which was believed to be the fastest speed that uh, either the American or the Japanese battle cruisers would attain. And they were designed to have a range of about 7,000 nautical miles. Um, in actuality, the American battle cruisers were being designed to be faster than this, as was the Iowa class battleships built a generation later. Um, and the uh, horsepower, 160,000 horsepower, doesn't seem like enough to move a 48,000 ton ship at 32 knots. Uh, it, it would probably break 30 knots, but I'm not sure it would have been enough. Uh, these ships did feature an interesting new hull form. Um, they were the culmination of a series of paper designs. Instead of in the pre-war years where you just build a new ship every year and spend money on it, uh, they just kept designing new designs and they started with hood uh, and they kept updating that design. Uh, and for many of the early designs, they kept uh, a very similar hull form to hood. And eventually, they get out and uh, come up with a new hull form. And uh, trust in this hull form may have been what made them think they could get 32 knots. And it is pretty hydrodynamically efficient. Whereas the Iowa class battleships and other classes uh, get wide and then come back and they have a rounded off stern. The G3s and the subsequent Lion class uh, curved around towards the back and they were cut off flat. And that is something that many modern ships do, but at that point was completely revolutionary. And the, uh, the idea is you're tricking the water as it goes around the hull. It is expecting to follow a teardrop shape and come back to a point. But really at a certain point, it gets to the back of the ship and the back of the ship disappears. So instead of continuing on in a point, the water all of a sudden has nowhere to go and it sort of pushes in. So it gives you a little bit more uh, hydrodynamic efficiency. Uh, so maybe they could have made 32 knots uh, with a range of only 7,000 nautical miles. That's vastly inferior to the Iowas. The Iowas could do about 15,000 nautical miles. Iowas, of course, designed to operate in the Pacific uh, without much resupply. The British are expecting to be able to resupply all over the world because they have colonies all over the world. Uh, in actuality, had these ships been built and had they deployed in World War II, that 7,000 nautical mile range uh, would have found these ships hard pressed to uh, search the Atlantic for German surface raiders like Scharnhorst, Neisenau, and Bismarck and would have found them hard pressed to operate in the Pacific, especially after the British colonies in that area were captured by the Japanese. Uh, they were designed to have about 1,700 crew members on board, um, which is significantly fewer than the Iowa class battleships. 
in actuality, had these ships continued to operate during World War II, they would have probably had far more anti-aircraft batteries and things added, and therefore more sailors. Uh, but the design, based on the, the armament that they were designed with in the 20s, was about 1700. They were designed to have nine 16 inch uh, 45 caliber guns. These guns had a range of about 38,000 yards and they fired about a 2,000 pound projectile. Um, so these ships are following the German practice. They've got a light shell going at high velocity. Uh, the Iowas have a very heavy shell at uh, a fairly low velocity. So the Iowa armor-piercing shell is 700 pounds heavier than the British. It's got uh, about two and a half miles greater range. And it uh, is lower velocity, so it tends to lob in more of an arc. It's more likely to hit the less armored deck than the belt of an enemy ship. The British, like I said, did not build these ships. However, they did use this basic gun design on uh, Nelson and Rodney, which we covered in a previous video. Um, this was the first triple turreted gun that the Royal Navy was designing for their own use. And uh, there were some serious teething problems with it, especially as it ended up on Nelson and Rodney. Uh, Nelson and Rodney were built to very severe treaty limitations. And so they used a lot of aluminum to save weight and uh, they had a lot of stuff cut to save weight. So it would be unfair to assume that had the G3s been built, their guns would have had the same uh, level of teething problems but given the issues that Nelson and Rodney and later King George V class had with their uh, multi-barrel turrets, and either turrets with greater than two barrels, uh, it, it would be fair to assume that there would have been some teething problems with the 16-inch guns on these ships. And likely, uh, likely those problems could have been sorted out by the time World War II began. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to take that too much into account here. Uh, the United States, on the other hand, had been building triple barrel guns since uh, prior to World War II began. The Nevada class was the first uh, class that, that featured them in U.S. use. Uh, and so by the time the Iowas came along, the U.S. Navy knew how to build them pretty well. And uh, these ships did not experience any sort of teething problems with their guns. The secondary battery would have been 16 six-inch guns. This would have been the first time that uh, the six-inch secondary battery was placed in turrets instead of in casemates. Uh, so the turrets are a much more modern design. Uh, the, this basic turret design was used on Nelson and Rodney and uh, on some British light cruisers, more or less, uh, and it worked very effectively only has a rate of fire of about five rounds a minute, so significantly lower than the uh, rate of fire of the secondary guns on uh, Iowa-class battleships, the five-inch guns. Uh, roughly one-third the output, but the shells are twice as heavy, and they've got uh, about two and a half miles greater range. Um, at this point, let's talk about the layout of these main guns, because that is the unique feature of the G3 design. Uh, they featured two triple turrets, super firing, just forward of the superstructure. Pretty common. Even the Iowas have that. Uh, and then they featured a citadel-type superstructure, which was a first for uh, British battleships. And this would be adopted again in the Nelson and Rodney class, and it would continue to be the standard all the way through the rest of British battleship design. After that superstructure was not the engineering plant like on most other battleships. It was the third turret. By squishing the turrets up forward around the superstructure, it compressed the magazines into that space. 
that's the part of the ship you need to armor the most. So it compressed the armored area of the ship. They lost something like 40 degrees of firing arc back aft. Uh, because this turret is sighted amidships, it's not all the way back aft. The uh, funnels and the mast, the boats, and the uh, engineering equipment is all aft of the gun turret. Uh, so that blocks the line of fire. But really, battleships are designed to fire on the broad side. So losing 40 degrees of uh, firing arc back aft isn't that severe. Uh, if her gun was to fire in that arc, uh, if, if she had a traditional layout, it would damage fittings at the back end of the ship. Likewise, if her forward guns fired over the bow, they would damage fittings there. Or if either gun trained too far inboard, it would damage fittings. And that did happen on New Jersey. Uh, and it happened on Nelson and Rodney. Uh, the, the amount of powder that you're firing, if you fire it angled too far over the bow or rotated too far around next to the superstructure, you will damage your superstructure or uh, your, your hull fittings back aft. And that happened on all of these ships. Um, and so unless it was an emergency, they were more or less restricted to firing off of the broadside. Uh, so losing that elevation wasn't that much of a problem. And it meant that you could only heavily armor a certain part of the ship, and the engineering plant could be less heavily armored. That's not going to explode catastrophically on you, and there is redundancy. If a boiler gets taken out, you've got other boilers. If an engine gets taken out, you have other engines. It, it'll reduce your speed, but you won't be dead in the water. Uh, so this not the same design per se, but the same concept of concentrating the main battery up forward was continued in a number of other designs. The uh, N3 battleships, the Nelson and Rodney, uh, the French Dunkirk and Strasbourg, and Richelieu and uh, Jean Bart, uh, all featured this layout uh, because they were all limited in displacement mostly by the Washington Naval Treaty, but in the case of the G3s and the N3s, um, they were limited by the dry dock capacity in uh, the United Kingdom and the colonies overseas where these ships could operate. So uh, they couldn't make them massively huge or else they'd have to spend even more money on their infrastructure. So by finding a more efficient way to uh, mount the main battery, one, it means that they're more likely to get funding, which in the post-war world is difficult. And two, they don't have to get funding for a bunch of extraneous stuff. Um, they just get to build a cheaper ship with a cheaper support system. Uh, in addition to the uh, six-inch guns, which were only anti-surface, they also had six 4.7-inch anti-aircraft guns. Uh, that would have been sorely deficient by World War II. And if Nelson and Rodney are any indication, there wouldn't be any significant upgrade to the heavy anti-aircraft battery. Uh, they had four eight-barreled 40-millimeter pom-poms in the design as well. And these would have most likely been upgraded in wartime, and you would have probably seen dozens of, of mounts for 40 millimeters all over the ship and then lighter 20 millimeter mounts added as well. Uh, so it's reasonable to assume uh, that these ships would have received upgrades similar to Nelson and Rodney and, and even the King George V classes wartime upgrades. And it's reasonable to assume that the medium and light anti-aircraft battery would have been comparable to other allied battleships uh, during the war. Uh, but that heavy anti-aircraft battery is pretty deficient, and there, there, there isn't really any making up for it. Uh, these ships also featured two 24 and a half inch torpedo tube launchers that uh, could have had as many as 16 torpedoes carried. Uh, and these were utterly superfluous by this time. Hopefully the design would have been built without them. 
uh, the previous HMS Hood was built with them and uh, many historians believe that detonating the torpedoes is uh, what caused the ship to be lost. Uh, Nelson and Rodney were completed with theirs and Rodney even was able to fire one of hers at Bismarck, uh, which is a fairly rare thing. The range of torpedoes is significantly lower than the range of the main battery gun, so it is entirely unlikely uh, for a battleship to close to torpedo range. And with only two tubes, one facing port and one facing starboard, uh, what's even the point? It takes a volley of torpedoes to uh, reliably score hits. Uh, so likely the ships would have been completed with them and likely it would have been an Achilles heel. The Iowas were not uh, completed with torpedo tubes. They were not designed with torpedo tubes and they never needed them. Uh, in terms of armor plating, these ships would have had a belt as thick as 14 inches, angled at 18 degrees. The Iowas have a 12 inch belt angled at 19 degrees. Uh, so the British ships have a greater equivalent thickness and they achieve this because only half of the length of their belt is uh, 14 inches thick, the forward half covering the magazines. The aft half covering the engine rooms is only 12 inches thick. Because the Iowas have their battery spread out, they're only able to get about 12.2 inches of armor for the entire length of the ship. Likewise, the deck is eight inches thick over the magazines and uh, four to six inches thick over the rest of the ship, meaning that um, they got a thicker armored deck over their magazines than the American ships had with their uh, six inch armored decks. Um, the barbettes were only 14 inches thick. The American ships had thicker barbettes. Uh, the turrets were roughly comparable, about 17 and a half inches on the face, eight inches on the roof. Uh, we had nine inches, uh, excuse me, six inches on the roof and we had seven inches, uh, eight inches on the sides and back when we had uh, nine inches. So, so the turrets are fairly comparable. Uh, the conning tower was only eight inches thick the Iowa conning tower is 17.3 inches thick. Uh, however, the British are already starting to work toward this idea of the conning tower being superfluous. Uh, and so I don't, I don't really ding them for having a thinner conning tower. So uh, how do these ships compare to the Iowas? In size, very well. In propulsion, they are a little bit inferior. The Iowas have significantly greater range and slightly greater speed. Uh, in firepower, the Iowas have a slightly better main battery gun. It can fire further, and even though they're the same diameter, it shells land uh, uh, heavier, there are heavier shells that, that we're landing, so they can do more damage. Uh, the Iowas also didn't have any teething problems with their turrets, which the G3s did. Uh, in terms of the six inch secondaries, they do have longer range than the secondaries of the Iowas. They, uh, have a much slower rate of fire and a heavier shell though. Uh, at about 10 miles, the Iowas are going to be landing uh, more than 50% more weight of shell on the target. At longer than 10 miles, the five inch guns can't reach uh, and up to about 12 and a half miles or so, the six inch guns can. Um, it should also be mentioned that the six inch guns, there are two pair on each side of the forward superstructure, more or less between the uh, main battery turrets. And there are two pair on each side at the aft end of the superstructure, aft of the funnels to cover the part of the firing arc that the 16 inch guns don't, don't cover. Uh, I would not ding the G3s for their restricted firing arcs. 
they lose about 40 degrees, um, whereas the Iowas have 360 degree coverage. It's unlikely that an engagement would be fought uh, firing backwards over the shoulder, so such as it is. Uh, and were these ships being chased, they could pretty easily zig and zag uh, a couple of uh, tens of degrees off center to be able to fire those over the shoulder shots, which uh, realistically the Iowas would be trying to do also, if uh, they were being chased, they wouldn't just try to fire with their three, uh, with their after three barrels. They would probably try to angle uh, something like 70 degrees to be able to get the over the shoulder shot from the forward guns. Uh, in terms of any aircraft battery, it's no comparison. These ships were 20 years older. Aircraft just weren't as big of a threat at that time. They had significantly better AA batteries than any of their contemporaries. Uh, they likely would not have had their, their long range batteries modified. Their lighter batteries may have been modified to comparable levels. Uh, torpedo armament, um, G3s have it, Iowa's don't. I consider that a detriment to the G3 design as opposed to the Iowa's not having it. Uh, in terms of armor, in many ways, the G3s are better. They have slightly thicker armor. Um, in a battle with any of their European peers, uh, any of the ships that were completed, their armor can stop the 15-inch guns of their enemies. Their armor probably cannot stop the 16-inch shells of the American ships, either under design in the 1920s or uh, as built with the Iowas nor the 18-inch shells of the uh, Japanese super battleships, either under design in the 1920s or actually built in the 40s. Uh, but it's a pretty effective system. In terms of torpedo defense, it's only uh, two void spaces thick, whereas the Iowas have uh, four void spaces. Uh, and it's not quite as deep as the Iowas. So torpedoes were not as big of a threat at that point, they hadn't grown as large as they would during World War II. So the Iowas do have a slightly better torpedo defense, although I wouldn't call either ship's uh, torpedo defense great by World War II standards, especially when you compare them to Japanese torpedoes. Uh, the G3s only have a double bottom, the Iowas have a triple bottom. Uh, so there's that as well. In terms of what they were designed to do, uh, the G3s were designed to save money. And they did that very well um, by making a series of paper designs prior to authorizing this. Uh, they were radically far uh, ahead of anything anyone else had. These ships the G3s are comparable to World War II era ships in almost every way. Um, ships that other countries wouldn't design for another 20 years. These ships are really ahead of their times. Uh, if you compare them to their peers being built at the same time, Lexington class battle cruisers or South Dakota battleships or Japanese uh, Amagi class battle cruisers or uh, Takeo class battleships, these ships look futuristic. They look way more like the ships that would actually be built in uh, the 1930s and 40s than any of the American or Japanese designs. Uh, so, so these ships are way ahead of their time and really ingenious in a lot of ways. But it's how the British use them that's really ingenious. They were finally authorized right before the Washington Naval Treaty started. The United States and Japan each had something like 16 capital ships under construction. At the end of the Washington Naval Treaty, all of, almost all of these ships would be scrapped. Uh, a couple would be allowed to be completed. Uh, but most would be scrapped. 
the British had hardly even uh, laid down their new ships. They purely existed on paper. So they traded uh, paper designs for actual American and Japanese ships that in some cases were 40% complete. Uh, so it cost the British nearly nothing to trade in these ships for a building holiday while the Americans and uh, Japanese lost huge investments in, in future warship development. Furthermore, the British were able to convince the American and the Japanese that because each of them had 16-inch armed ships, and they did not, uh, that they should be able to build two new ships, which started with the N3 and the G3 designs, uh, and eventually uh, they each cut about 10,000 tons off and became the Nelson and Rodney, which were then some of the most modern ships of the interwar period. Uh, so the British really won the Washington Naval Treaty. They traded nothing and got a building holiday and new ships. Uh, while the Japanese lost the Washington Naval Treaty, uh, they could have had closer uh, equality to the British and Americans, but were sort of bullied into a second-rate status. Uh, and the Americans could have done much better. They could have done a lot worse. So. Uh, In terms of that, the G3s were very successful. And had they been built, um, they, they would have also been fairly successful. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or comments about this video, leave them in the comment section down below and we'll get back to you. What was your favorite ship that was canceled by the Washington Naval Treaty? Do you have any suggestions for uh, future ships to compare? Again, these were proposed by one of our viewers uh, and if you have a suggestion, we'll get to it uh, in the next couple of months. If you like our museum, our channel, and the work we're doing, consider donating. Uh, in the description below, there's a link to our GoFundMe campaign, uh, and all of the proceeds that go into that come into our uh, YouTube channel and allow us to create more content. We do try to put out several pieces of content a week, uh, so remember to like, share, and subscribe so you're notified when we're putting out new stuff. Thanks for watching.